So let's let's switch to uh, number 12 here tomorrow. We're going to go uh, show here. This is a uh, Saraya al-Quds, uh, Islamic Jihad's armed wing. We're looking at a photo, uh, at a video footage of them seeing Israeli soldiers, uh, dismounted Israeli soldiers in a building. And now we're seeing them, their fighters, knocking a loophole, a sniper loophole, out of the the wall of this destroyed house, um, in contrast to the Israelis who stand in the windows and put curtains up when they're in there, we're seeing a fighter, a sniper, a clearly skilled sniper, uh, set back from the wall, which is just basic uh, military uh, procedure, um, not visible, and dropping Israeli soldiers who are outside of a building with sniper fire, which is also... Uh, a key operational um, tactic that we will see in the buffer zone uh, because there is no possibility of creating a defensive zone where Israeli soldiers are when Palestinians have the capabilities that they have now, which they didn't have 20 years ago. And when they were expelled to Marja Zahur in 1994, they didn't have uh, these uh, resources that they have built with their own hands in the Gaza Strip for themselves. So this is a sniper attack dropping a soldier. Let's go to the next one tomorrow because there's another one that we see. Um, again, uh, this is a Saraya Al-Quds unit using a 50 cal sniper rifle. We're seeing footage right now of them inside a destroyed building that has no hole in the wall. And we're seeing right now uh, one of their fighters um, poking a hole in the wall using a hammer very carefully to make the hole as small as possible. Um, and then the fighters um, looks looks a bit like the same sniper. These are both uh, Gaza City shots um, that are taking place. Again, dismounted soldiers moving what they believe is a safe area uh, and a fighter in a hoodie and a, and a toque uh, popping a loophole out and, and targeting uh, these Israeli soldiers, which is something that will happen constantly uh, in that. I just wanted to throw in a couple of Sarai al-Quds there. Um, again, we, we're showing, uh, actually, that this one's from Barej, actually. This is the Central Camps, again. So shout out to the Central Camps resistance that has been fierce uh, uh, for, since this third phase uh, when Israel has moved into the center and the south. Um, the resistance by these groups have been, uh, by by all resistance factions, we we tend to show these videos by Qassam and Sarai al-Quds, um, in part because they have the... Um, um, they have the film crew, they have the uh, expertise, uh, they have the information operations embedded into their units. But uh, there's 10 armed groups in the Gaza Strip that are carrying out operations uh, uh, daily. So Sarai al-Quds is the Islamic yeah. Jihad, the armed wing of Islamic Jihad. And the Qassam Brigades are the uh, armed wing of the uh, Hamas I, movement. I, I Something that always strikes me, John, this is a may sound a little bit weird but sometimes when i'm driving and i see all the raccoons and sometimes deer killed on the roads and it makes me very very sad and i say well you know animals have such incredible ways of communication and instinct but they don't have language the same way we do because i just wish like the deer could tell the other deer stay away from the roads or you know, if you see headlights, don't cross the road. They don't have that ability to do that. So they can never, I don't know, learn over time. Uh, but like, presumably Israeli soldiers do have that ability. And so my, no, my question is like, aren't they telling each other, stay away from the windows, they can't don't walk it. out? I mean, yeah. like they love windows. Are they like raccoons? I mean, what what is going on? I mean, raccoons are actually lovable creatures. I know that's a touchy topic in Toronto, but um, I'm pro raccoon though. Yeah, raccoon. I know. They're but like I mean, animal groups. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm being a little lighthearted about it, but the serious question is: Is there no? You know, we've you've been telling us, you've been showing us how. Hamas learns from its experience, how Hezbollah learns from its experience, even within the context of this battle. So yes, they're learning over decades, but they're also learning over days and weeks in the context of this genocidal war. 
why aren't the Israelis learning? I don't have an answer to that. I think we, we, we'll we'll have to ask them after. I I, I mean, there there was footage shown the other day of a of a Sarai Al Quds force coming into the house that the Israelis are in and right. fighting inside the house. We have showed that video. I don't think YouTube would leave that uh, video up, but they're fighting inside the house. And one of the things that you see from the from the Israeli soldier on his helmet cam is that he goes right to the window. He's like, it's almost like he's looking for an extra yeah. window to go to. It's not clear why why they're not learning these lessons. Um, uh, maybe they are learning the lessons and we're just seeing the ones who aren't. Um, but no, it's not clear. What we're seeing is a is a fighting force that is not able to carry out um, the orders of of their generals that are saying that they're going to fight in Gaza for a year. Um, not, nothing shows that the Israelis are, are prepared for that in, as a, on a societal level or on a military level um, to carry out uh, what what they claim uh, that they're going to do, which is why I think we're starting to see like this week we saw Israeli and American intelligence reports leaked kind of to the Washington Post and to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal about the number of of uh, Qassam fighters uh, that the Israelis have killed um, looking for an exit. And they they use this term combat ineffective that we talked about. Uh, where 30, if 30% 30 of your force has been killed or wounded um, and can't come back to fight, that that unit is considered combat ineffective, which is obviously uh, not true for a Palestinian guerrilla force that's able to re, uh, re uh, appoint leaders uh, and to move fighters in a fighting force that um, that is more than 40,000. And the Israelis have, have kind of ratcheted strangely in an, in an effort to exit this war, ratcheted down the number of fighters that they believe that the Qassam brigades have um, down to 25,000 so that they can get these numbers to, to line up. Because in the Western media, these counting numbers are something that they rely on. Body count. Uh, I mean, talk, John, talk about count. the history of body counts in the context of the Vietnam War and what that stood for, how, how that symbolized the American failure. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the Americans used to shoot the the the, the wildlife and count the wildlife uh, as their numbers uh, in that attack while they were getting smoked by the uh, Vietnamese resistance. Um, and so these numbers, like Israel trying to say that they've killed nine thousand Qassam fighters, it's just it's there's no evidence whatsoever of that. If that number is true, there's no men in all of Gaza who are not in the Qassam brigades, because that's the number of men that have been killed. But just to say, like, I follow the Israeli uh, military, uh, you know, uh, very closely throughout this, and I watch every single one of their videos. And if, if I told you that there wasn't even 50 corpses in their videos, I don't want to put a number out, but uh, the number is in the dozens. Uh, and we don't even know that they're fighters that they put out in their videos. Their videos are essentially videos of, of snuff films from the air um, where they're saying that that person uh, is a fighter. And even still, even if you took all of their videos and all of the people that they kill in all of their videos, there's nothing like thousands. Uh, it's just, it's, it's lies. And partially the military censor allows for these lies, but I mean, partially the thing that you described in your report, Ali, is it's all part of that. The, the, the media is intertwined with these fighting forces. Um, and it's like they can't, you know, she, Elizabeth Dwoskin has hundreds of thousands of words of electronic intifada, including tens of thousands from the Gaza Strip itself, if she wanted to report on what was going on. Um, but there's no, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any interest in that. There's nothing like um, the Isra the New York Times appears to be the same as the Israeli censor. If you type Hannibal into the New York Times search engine, you're not going to get anything about uh, you know the the dozens of stories that uh, that have appeared in the Israeli press. It's almost the Israelis uh, with their censor are almost more uh, telling us more than the uh, than the Western media. So let's just let's just look at the last few of these videos here. Um, this number 14 tomorrow, this is, um, uh, again, troops at, walking around outside a building that they presumably feel they have control of. Um, and then we see fighters, uh, uh, Qassam fighters, um, the armed wing of Hamas, um, uh, fighters uh, f using a thermobaric warhead built in the Gaza Strip. 
uh, on lathes uh, underground, um, as all of these weapons that we're seeing uh, uh, for this throughout this war, the weapons that we're seeing are built by Palestinians. And part of the reason why they're able to still fight four months on um, is because the preparation that their own arms industry created. And the Israelis talk about that too, saying, well, we didn't expect it to be as vital that their arms industry wasn't this vital. Um, they didn't expect that the that there was 50% more tunnels than the largest tunnel estimate they say. Like Kogat said that the, the, the tunnels are an astonishing feat. Um, you know, these are... Palestinians defending themselves against genocide with their own hands, with things built in their own communities, um, and fighting for communities that are now uh, in Jabalia in this case, although there's still, as we know, a lot of people in the north, um, the vast, vast majority of people have been driven from their homes and are living in very dangerous circumstances in the south, in places where Israel told them to go, and they're now under attack. Um, which is also something you can read about on the electronic intifada, but uh, it's not clear that you're going to read about that in the Washington Post. Um, let, let's just roll through the last, um, uh, let's do 16 tomorrow, because this is a, a video by the Kassam Brigades um, from Gaza City, and we can see, again, soldiers in a window, um, but in this video that we're going to watch, we're going to see, we're seeing Palestinians who are in the building literally across the street, uh, literally the next building over, um, targeting with Palestinian made warheads that are various uh, warheads. Here they're targeting uh, an armored vehicle um, using a different warhead than they target this, uh, the soldiers on foot. Um, here they are using an RPG against a bulldozer. Um, here's dismounted soldiers. Uh, walking, and this is a fragmentation warhead that's used um, that's used against uh, personnel. So we're seeing the fighters make choices. Uh, there's no nothing indicating shortages. Um, there's nothing indicating uh, any kind of degrading of these resistance operations. If anything, the fighters now know better what weapons to use in what circumstance and what's more effective. There's another soldier in a window that we're watching. And we're also watching in Gaza City uh, here a soldier be hit on the waterfront, which Israel said that it took control of in November. Um, and now we're seeing soldiers in a window uh, being hit in along the waterfront. Um, and so th these videos all show that the buffer zone, it's not a thing. The Israelis aren't going to create a, a, a buffer zone where their soldiers are somehow not going to be attacked. Um, the only way out of this situation for Israel is to negotiate a prisoner exchange um, and to negotiate with, with Hezbollah in the north to get uh, some kind of agreement for liberated territory, the Sheba farms, um, to get that territory back. Um, and to to have some kind of a diplomatic um, exit to this, which I think we're starting to see from the Americans and the French, um, that the Israelis need, which they needed in 2006 as well. We remember in 2006, they didn't want a ceasefire in 2006. Um, and then they carried out the ground operation, got smoked, and then wanted a ceasefire. And it's um, important so to we'll note now, John, uh, on this, this is very important because this also tells us something about you know, we can look at it from the perspective of the videos which shows what's happening on the battlefield, but the diplomatic uh, developments also tell us what's happening on the battlefield. And what I mean by that is that Israel is desperate for a ceasefire, but without calling it a ceasefire, because they have painted themselves into this corner where they're saying they, they have all these big goals, we're going to destroy Hamas, obliterate Hamas, Gaza is going to be changed for generations. We're going to free the hostages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they know because they said it in the beginning, stupidly, they said it, and Blinken said it, that a ceasefire means Hamas won. So now they can't agree to a ceasefire that they desperately want because they by their own definition, that's defeat for them. Their publicly stated definition. That's defeat for them. So what are they doing now? They keep sending these proposals through the mediators, uh, whether it's Qatar or Egypt. And the latest one is, oh, we'll give you a two-month 
cease fire in exchange for freeing the uh, prisoners of war and will allow the senior leaders of Hamas to leave the Gaza Strip and, you know, all sorts of other things. No um, release of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails, though. That was also part of their... Well, proposal. you know, the, the point is, right. yeah, I mean, it's all these different things. Yeah. And Hamas is saying, no, we will not accept that. Not for a month, not for two months, not for six months. It has to be a permanent ceasefire. Yeah. That's our condition. So the point I'm making is they feel that they can hold that line. So their assessment of what's happening on the battlefield, clearly their assessment of what uh, resources they have is that they can hold that line. They stated that very clearly a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 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 Abu Ubaidah, the spokesperson for the, for the military wing of Has of of Hamas, the Al Qassam Brigades, Abu Ubaida, as he's known. That's the only way we know him. For for you know, he's the man who appears with his face covered in the kafiya, and he's sort of this legendary figure. He made that very clear. We will not accept anything less than a permanent ceasefire. Osama Hamdan, another uh, uh, senior Hamas leader in uh, Beirut, who gives these. Uh, daily press conferences has been crystal clear about that. So the Israelis are the ones who constantly keep increasing their offer. First, they were saying a two-week ceasefire and, and free the prisoners. Now we're up to two months. And this is coming from the Israeli side. Yeah, they, they, yeah, there's they, Israelis don't have the ability to continue this war I indefinitely, and the Palestinians are not going to surrender. This idea that that Sinwar is surrounded by captives is ridiculous. The idea that they're going to have any kind of negotiations happening um, that involve—I mean, I don't want to predict, but I, I think one of the things that I wouldn't uh, I, that I would be confident predicting is that Yahya Sinwar is not going to take exile uh, as no, part of this no deal. Way. So um, these kind of talks uh, are ridiculous, and what you see is is Israel looking for a way out of a war that they're losing. And we've told you that for four months that they're going to lose this war and that they're fighting against uh, Palestinians who have dedicated their entire life to this liberation struggle. And if it, if they didn't ha and they weren't dedicating their life to it before, they definitely are now. Um, and this is no question that this is a national liberation struggle that nobody's going to surrender. Uh, it, it, no Palestinians wanting that. We're not even we're not seeing anything like that. We're seeing. Uh, footage every single day of devastation of attacking civilians and those civilians supporting um, the resistance. You're not going to genocide your way uh, out of this national liberation struggle. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.